Harry Met, virtual traveller, and welcome to Stories from Law, a monthly podcast that explores folklore and the stories it inspires. My name is Dawn Nelson, and I'm an author and professional storyteller. Today, I'm looking at the folklore behind black dogs and spectral hounds. The story from law for this episode is my original story, The Lunarian's Tale. Black dogs are a well-known feature of British folklore, so much so that there are many names for these spectral creatures. Appearing as fearsome black, curly-haired, flaming-eyed, ghostly apparitions, black dogs can be both good and bad. The most common name is Black Shuck, and this name hails from East Anglia. It is thought that this may be to do with the wiry, curly hair, sometimes referred to as a shock of hair, that Black Shook is covered in. To the weary traveller, the being will come into view as if on a mist. This translucent dog is described as being anywhere from Great Dane size to as big as a calf. The only sound to indicate it is there is the soft pad of its feet on the ground, hence it is sometimes called padfoot. It has been reported by some that the black dog is a cyclops, with only one fiery eye in the middle of its forehead. But one thing is for sure, whoever sees the black dog of folklore is never quite the same again. You'll know you're looking at the black dog because your hair will stand on end and you'll get goosebumps across your flesh. So what if it's other names? Because there are many. Going back to the name Black Shook for a moment... Not only is it thought that this referred to the dog's black hair, the shock of hair, but also to have derived from the word skooka, which means devil in Anglo-Saxon. So a wiry-haired devil dog, basically. In Yorkshire, the beast is known as the bar guest, hairy jack and the padfoot, the latter name because, again, as I said, the sound of its feet on the ground as it approaches is padding feet. Galley trot, snarly yowl, yeth, Whist hounds, guy trash, scryker and girt dog are all other names you may hear used to refer to the hound. And in fact, there are only two counties where the black dog has not actually been seen. Those counties are Middlesex and Rutland. So if you happen to live in one of the other 25 counties where you might come across this black dog, where exactly will you see it? Well, you might see it if you're out at the time when the veil is thin and the liminal space is just that little more elastic. So these places that you might encounter one of these dogs are places of transition. So it might be the dawn or or the dusk or times of year when the veil is thinner. For example, the Beltane on the 1st of May or the Sawain on the 31st of October, 1st of November. Or it could be a place like a crossroad, bridges, streams, rivers or graveyards even. These are all places of transition because although they may not seem it, Graveyards are also places where they move from the living to the dead. They're a place where we move from life to death. In fact, there was a tradition where people would bury a black dog live under the corner of a church so that its soul could toll the bell for those who had just died. This saved a human from having to do this task and this black dog under the corner of the church is referred to as a church grim. So what are the history of this hound? Well, the first written account of the black dog with this description comes in the form of the Saxon Chronicle and talks of the dogs of the Wild Hunt. The Wild Hunt is a spectral pack of dogs with men riding horses among them. It's sometimes associated with Norse mythology. The Saxon Chronicles were records which were written by different people in different places around the country during the latter half of the Saxon occupation of Britain. So the section where the black dog is referred to is from the Peterborough Chronicle, dated 1127. And here's what it says. Or rather, here's a translation of what it says. Many men both saw and heard a great number of huntsmen hunting. The huntsmen were black and huge and hideous and rode on black horses and black goats and their dogs were jet black with eyes like saucers and horrible. This, to me, is particularly interesting because in Norse mythology, Odin is associated with the wild hunt and has two dogs named Jerry and Freaky. And Thor also has goats, those black goats that they referred to, Snala and Grinder. So is this a witness statement or a record of some old mythology that the Christianised Saxons tried to tame, perhaps? 
I'll let you decide that. Almost 900 years later, in 2014, in Layston Abbey, Suffolk, they found the bones of a huge dog. Pottery fragments in the area confirmed that these bones were potentially from around the 1500s. Could this have been a black dog? In fact, there is a story of a black dog, not far from where this skeleton was found. The black dog of Bungie, Blytheborough, Suffolk, is the most famous sighting of this being. On the 4th of August 1577, a large dog burst through the doors of St Mary's Church, Bungie, accompanied by a clap of thunder and ran up the aisle and past the congregation, killing several people as he went. And then, disaster upon disaster, the church steeple fell in, killing a few more. And then the dog disappeared. A quote from the Time reports, All down the church, midst of fire, the hellish monster flew, and passing onwards to the choir, he many people slew. This encounter led to them being associated with thunder, which again takes us back once more to Thor and Odin and that Norse mythology. So could that skeleton that was found in 2014, that was thought to have come from the 1500s, Could that have been the Bungie dog? Well, I'll let you decide whether that dog is real or myth. If you do see one of these dogs, though, is it a good thing or a bad thing? Well, that depends on where you are in the country and which black dog you have seen. So let's take a look at some of the other black dogs of the UK. On the island of Jersey, Booley Bay has a black dog that is said to drag a chain along behind it. Whilst people aren't physically harmed by this dog, They seem to become psychologically damaged. If you visit the Jersey Maritime Museum, you'll find a mock head of the black dog, which was said to have been used by smugglers to frighten people away. The smugglers would put the large model over their head and over their body because it's an enormous mask if you've seen it. And then they would put the goods that they were smuggling within the head of the dog. It was thought that this would stop people getting too close and uncovering their nefarious business, basically. So did the smugglers make up the black dog of Booley Bay or was it a myth that was already in existence? Hmm. Perhaps one of those bits of folklore that have become muddled in history. In Wales, the Coonanoon are spectral hounds, which are again associated with the wild hunt. And they've been mentioned in one of the oldest stories, the Mabinogion. At Ditchling Beacon in Sussex, there have been tales of a headless dog that walks the footpath all the way to the graveyard. Perhaps it's a church grim gone astray. Further south in Dartmoor are the wished hounds or yesh hounds that stalk the moors. It is these dogs that appear in the work of Arthur Conan Doyle, in particularly the Hound of the Baskervilles. So these dogs sound pretty fearsome, don't they? And it doesn't really seem like They're such a good idea to come across in the night when you're walking home. However, there are some black dogs which are considered good. So, which ones are these? So all the dogs I've mentioned so far act as portents and harbingers of bad luck, death and, well, destruction. But there are some that have good intentions. The Moddy Doo of the Isle of Man is said to be a black dog that used to pad into the officer's room at Peel Castle and sit by the fire. No harm came of anybody as long as they didn't try to harm the Moddy Doo. Now, there was an incident where a soldier did try to frighten the dog off, but that ended badly for the officer in question. So the Moddy Doo isn't exactly good, but isn't exactly bad either. In the Shetland Islands, the wolver is a friendly fishing werewolf that will share his food with you if you are in dire need. So this wolver just leaves some fish on your windowsill if you're really hungry. He seems like quite a nice guy in my opinion. Scottish black dogs guard treasure and the girt dogs of Somerset are said to be guardians of children and lone travellers. So, you see, the black dog is starting to become a bit more of a complex character, isn't he? There is one last legend that I would like to mention, and that is the legend of the Welsh dog Gellert. It is one of a dog who was loyal to his master to a fault, and it is a tragic tale of assumption. But that perhaps is a story that I shall leave you to find out about. A story for another day, perhaps. Because now I would like to tell you 
The Lunarian's Tale. This is an original story written by myself, and it's about a wronged man, a black dog, and a white cat. In the village of Tolbury Darcy, there stands a murder stone. It stands by the canal and marks the site of a crime that took place over 1,500 moons ago. Around it grow forget-me-nots, but they need not worry. On the night of the murder, the moon wore a hazy corona and sat low in the sky. Peering through the window of the Black Dog Inn, this is what it saw. I don't believe a word of it, I tell you. It's always worked for me, stuffing an old shirt with straw and sticking a hat on it. Well, now that's doltish. John Staples slammed his fist emphatically down on the bar. A local arable farmer and well-liked by the villagers, long days in the field meant long evenings in the local inn. Staple had a reputation, though. His wife had died young in childbirth, and as a result, he was one of the only bachelors left in that village. Women queued up to look after him and his young son. You can't be serious, John. Hanging dead crows from a stick still sounds like voodoo to me. Arthur Brigg replied, smirking into his tankard. Dialectic jousting with this particular farmer was his favourite occupation. That and his beloved chicken farm. It's all about sending the right message, Arthur. Crows beware. John emphasised this point with wide eyes and a theatrical wave of his hand, culminating in an eruption of laughter from the locals, which caused the copper pans hanging from the wooden beams to rattle and tinkle slightly. The revelry was interrupted by a gust of wind bursting through the old oak door of the inn. With it, it brought Elijah Brannigan. The local ironmonger's broad shoulders filled the doorway, his outline black against the night sky. Staple! he bellowed into the pub. Staple, I'll have you! John turned on his bar stool to face the figure in the door. The inn was silent. And how can I help you, Elijah? He smiled calmly. The furious being that was Brannigan now stood inches away from him. Arthur Brigg reviewed his position and edged away from his fellow farmer towards the far end of the bar. He was not a small man himself, but there were few who'd taken on Elijah Brannan. Now, Elijah, calm down. We don't want any trouble here, do we? He said as he backed away up the bar. He's been having it away with my wife. Do you think that's something I should be calm about? Elijah was spitting with fury as his hand gripped the bar beside John, his knuckles as white as the moon. John said nothing and turned purposefully in his chair to face the bar again. Taking the final gulp of his pint, he pushed the tankard towards the barmaid Alice and asked for a refill. All eyes were on John Staple. Lurching forward, Elijah grasped the front of John's smock and forced him round in his stool. Don't you turn away from me, Staple. What have you got to say for yourself? He said. Attempting to prise the fingers away, But with little success, John stood up from the bar with Elijah still attached. He matched Elijah in height, but did not carry the same sheer mass. The inn held its breath. Not a tankard clinked, not a chair scraped. They were silent in anticipation. Calmly, John replied. Now Elijah... What makes you think I would want to cause a man of your standing such distress? Elijah's face creased. Don't try to fool me, Staple. I know your sort. I have no quarrel with you, Elijah. When do you think I've had the time to service your wife? There was a deep intake of breath from the villagers. Had the inn not stood on strong foundations, it may well have been consumed with a collective vacuum. The only thing that stirred was a sleeping cat on the corner of the bar. A huge white beast named Pangaban. It lifted itself from his sleep and stretched its paws towards the pair, mercifully breaking Elijah's concentration long enough for Alice to intervene. He's been here all evening, Elijah. 
John knows better than to mess with you. Now come on, have a drink and be friends, she said. Elijah pulled his hand away from John's smock and stood tall against him. I'll have you, John Staple. One day your sins will catch up with you. John took back his empty tankard and raised it to Elijah. God bless you, Elijah. I swear I have done nothing to your wife as God is my witness. Seething, Elijah turned on his heel and stormed towards the door. Stopping before his exit, he turned to John with a sneer. You'd better watch your back, John Staple. If I don't get you, old Shuck will. In the silence that followed the bang of the door, Brannigan's footsteps could be heard pounding the lane. Arthur slid his pint back up the bar to rejoin his friend. <laughs> old Shuck indeed, I never heard such codswallop, he said. And the pub joined him in raucous laughter that no doubt Brannigan would still have been able to hear as he retreated along the path. Stroking Pangaban, John muttered, Think I can thank you for saving me from that beating, Panga, me old friend. You want to watch yourself, John. Alice smiled, passing him a whiskey. Here, you might want that to calm your nerves. Now wrong with my nerves, Alice, but you know, if you insist. He winked and raised his glass. Alice rested her chin in her hands. Her elbows and ample bosom rested on the bar, imposing themselves on Arthur's horizon. The midwife reckons she's seen old Shook over a dozen times, she said. Arthur continued to drink his pint, transfixed by the view. I wouldn't pay it much credence, Alice. I bet she's seen all sorts in the hours she keeps, John replied. Maybe so, but she swears he follows her on her bicycle some nights, trotting along beside her. She reckons he's some kind of guardian, you know, of women and children, making sure the bairns are delivered safely into the world. Says he's huge, the size of a calf, hair all wiry and his eyes all glowing. Gives me the creeps just thinking about it. She shuddered, and her breasts swayed in their white linen hammock. Shaking his head to break away from Alice's hypnotic display, Arthur took a long swig of his ale. I thought old Chuck was something us farmers made up to keep away the beak hunters and sheep rustlers, he said, wiping his mouth with the back of his hand, pushing his tankard forward for another refill. I've seen it. I've seen him with my own eyes. William Exshaw roused himself from the chair beside the fire. He ain't no myth. Midwife's right. Huge thing he is, with eyes that burn right into your soul. I'd watch out if I were you, John. I've heard he's got a taste for sinners. The fire cracked loudly, emphasising Exshaw's story. You're crazy, Exshaw, on two accounts. Old Shuck does not exist, and I am no sinner. The good Lord would want me to enjoy my life, and what's wrong with that? John knocked back the whisky Alice had given him. I saw him too. A new voice joined the conversation, his silhouette framed in the window, the moon winked from over his shoulder. And what might you know about this, stranger? demanded Arthur, turning on his stool. I've seen him, sure as a nose on my face, the stranger replied. Arthur tapped his head and replied, acknowledging the stranger's accent. I suggest you get yourself to bed. You southerners can't take your ale. I saw what I saw, the stranger replied. Arthur rolled his eyes at John as he turned his back on the shadow once more. Ah, oh, well, said John, I best get back, Arthur. I've had enough excitement for one night. Daisy's with the boys, so I best go before it's too late for her to walk home. John finished his pint and stood up. Aye, John, fair enough. I might just stay for another, though. He winked at his friend and nodded towards Alice, who was petting Pangaban. John smiled at his friend, patted him on the back and headed for the door. As he left the warmth of the pub, the cold air hit John hard. The alcohol had fuzzed his head and swayed his legs. Retrieving his bicycle from the old oak tree, he looked up at the full moon that would guide him home. If he squinted, he was sure he could see a face smirking at him. It wasn't far to the farm. A short cycle past the manor house, along the canal, across the fields. Uh, well, they were his fields and he'd be home. Wobbling slightly, he headed up the towpath. The moon glinted off the water and little puffs of smoke from the chimneys of moored barges drifted on zephyrs. 
His bicycle squeaked gently and the occasional rustle from the hedgerow was comforting, a reminder that life was close by. The local constable passed him at Chising Lock and nodded a friendly good evening. Cycling on, the moon shone bright in the clear navy blue sky, its, its light glinting off the handlebars of the bicycle. He breathed in the cold night air and pulled his overcoat closer. Passing the lockkeeper's cottage, he became aware of something that was walking with him. He felt a tingling creep up his arms and into his neck as his hair stood on end. To his right was a dark shape, almost as tall as the handlebars. He could have reached out and touched it if he'd wanted. It was that close, and there was no mistaking the coarse black hair and glowing eyes. He swayed dangerously close to the canal and twisted to see if he could see the constable still, but he was gone, probably into one of the barges to warm up and have a cup of coffee. Turning back to the apparition, he discovered that it too was gone. John shook his head and muttered, too much of the grain, staple, stick to the ale in future. His breath formed little clouds of moisture and he sped up a little to ward against the cold. At least that's what he told himself. The wind was starting to gather force and he pulled his coat tighter still, cycling on against the night. In the distance, on the towpath, he could see a hazy white shape. The bike swerved again as he shook his head. What had Alice put in that whisky? But another hundred yards on and there it was. The white furry body of Pangaban sat by the edge of the canal, washing his paws in the moonlight. How had Panga got here? Panga was never out the pub. No one had ever seen Pangaban outside the four walls of the Black Dog Inn, ever. As he got nearer, John hopped off his bike and went to stroke the familiar friend. He stooped towards the edge of the canal, his bike dropping away from him, stretching out his hand to stroke his old friend. There was nothing there. He anticipated the warmth of the cat's fur, but it was missing as he reached out for what he'd seen only seconds before. There was just nothing there, just fresh air. Standing up again, he felt something hard hit the back of his head. He heard the thud of the wood and the crack of his skull as the world went black. His limp body pitched forward and into the canal. Ever watchful, only the moon saw him floating in the still water, prone with outstretched slack arms. It watched until no bubbles remained, no bubbles glistening in its light. The stone by the canal stands in memory of John Staple. Only the moon knows it wasn't old shock that did for him. Instead, it was a friendly white cat and the wrath of a wronged man. I hope you've enjoyed this episode. You can find an extended version of it featuring the white cats of French folklore and the story from the law, Catwoman, on my Patreon, Rewild Yourself Through Story as well as digital zines and audio stories. You can find this at www.patreon.com forward slash DD Storyteller. And I do hope to see you there as I would love to tell you another story. Please consider leaving me a review too, as reviews help these stories to journey out into the world and reach new audiences. You may notice that season one's shows are being released weekly. And that's because these shows were originally aired as live stream shows earlier this year, and I've now converted them to audio for the purposes of the podcast. Season two will be launched in the new year, and the episodes will then be released monthly. For more stories woven with folklore in the old ways, you can also find me on Facebook as DD Storyteller, and on Instagram as at DD underscore Storyteller. I also have a Facebook group called Stories from Law, and there we share folklore and music and books and chat a little about the podcast. Thank you for listening. And I'll see you again soon for more stories from Law. Toodle pip!